Welcome to the Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Every episode is free on our website at murderin20.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. Also learn about upcoming episodes on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. To support Murder in 20, feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them. We're not shy. And we couldn't do this podcast without all our sources, which we acknowledge throughout the podcast and are listed on our website. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. The weather in early spring in San Diego, California is fairly warm. Mardi Gras celebrations had just finished and the San Diego Padres were playing baseball. 47-year-old Suzanne was driving her Ford Granada in the afternoon down Interstate 15 when she was pulled over by Craig Pyre, an officer with the California Highway Patrol, or CHP for short. She told the Times Advocate she got this creepy feeling and was scared to death and knew something was wrong. Then when another San Diego police car passed them, Officer Craig left. Then in July, Romanita was pulled over by the San Diego CHP officer on the interstate. Craig used his car as loudspeaker and directed her to the Mercy Road exit. He told her she had a faulty headlight and gave her a written warning. But only after he spent a long time talking to her. She told the LA Times that the traffic stop was strange. It was pitch black and that anything could have happened to me. I could have screamed out and nobody would have heard me. On November 23rd, it happened again. An unidentified woman was pulled over by Craig. She was driving her Volkswagen when he used his loudspeaker in his car to instruct her to leave the interstate and go to the end of the Mercy Road off-ramp. She pulled over, drove the off-ramp a bit, slowed down, and stopped. The off-ramp was under construction and a dead end. He told her she had a dim headlight, and it didn't help that the car's registration was expired. But the odd thing was, he didn't issue her a ticket. Instead, he was friendly and engaged her in a long conversation, which unnerved her. She almost felt like he was going to ask her out on a date. He eventually allowed her to leave without giving her a ticket. It wasn't long before Craig pulled over another young, attractive woman. KCST-TV reported that on December 16th, Donna was driving her Volkswagen along Interstate 15 with her husband, who was slumped down sleeping in the passenger seat. Craig pulled her over and forced her to drive down the Mercy Road off-ramp and park under the bridge. He gave her a citation for speeding. Her husband said he found the traffic stop creepy. On Saturday, two days after Christmas, Karen Ott's boyfriend of almost four years, Wayne Batista, wasn't feeling well. Aside from her beautiful blonde hair and a warm smile, she was a thoughtful and considerate 20-year-old attending San Diego State University, and still lived with her parents. She jumped into her 1960 white Volkswagen bug and made the 45-minute trip to her boyfriend's house to take care of him. Now we all remember those iconic cars, shaped like a big bubble. They had very little frills. In high school, my girlfriend had one, and the only heat came off the engine through these little vents under the sides of our seats. Driving around in the winter, we absolutely froze, but it was a blast. After spending the day with Wayne, she decided to head home at 8 p.m., but before she left, as she often did, she phoned her parents to let them know she was on her way. She stopped at 8.20 at a Chevron station for gas, then continued on home. But by 10 p.m., Kara hadn't arrived, and her family was worried. This was highly unusual for her. She was extremely punctual. Then it was approaching 11 p.m. and her dad Sam called Poway Sheriff's deputies for help, but they weren't any help, telling him that Kara had to be missing for 24 hours before he could file a missing persons report. Now Officer Craig was working CHP patrol that night and at 9.40 p.m. pulled over Jean-Pierre Julie and his twin brother for having non-operating taillights. Now Jean-Pierre noticed at the time of the ticket was 9.40 and had been crossed out and was changed to 9.20, which he thought was odd because they'd just finished watching a murder mystery at his sister's house that ended at 9.30. 
Then at 9.45 p.m., Officer Craig stopped to buy gas at a Shell station. The night manager, Karen Anderson, told the Times Advocate that she asked the officer how his night was going and he replied he'd had one hell of a night. She noticed he had three claw marks on his nose and both cheeks that were bleeding and the blood was starting to drip down his face. And when she mentioned it, he turned away. The cashier, Shirley Schwartz, noticed the scratches on his face as well. She said he looked disheveled and nervous. Meanwhile, without the police's help, Kara's family took it upon themselves to start searching for her. Sam, his wife Joyce, and their two other daughters, Cynthia and Cheryl, his son-in-law William, and Kara's boyfriend Wayne, began driving the route she would have taken. They combed the interstate and the off-ramps looking for her white Volkswagen bug. In the darkness, the family searched all night. After almost eight hours, they were tired and exhausted, when at 6.30 a.m., William drove past the Mercy Road off-ramp and spotted Kara's car. The window was rolled down, and her keys were still hanging in the ignition. But Kara wasn't in the car. He called out for her. There was no answer, and he had a terrible feeling. It was dark, and he couldn't see her. Where was Kara? William drove off and called family members and the police. As daylight started to appear and the sky lightened, police found Kara's body, laying 65 feet below the off-ramp in a creek bed. The Mercy Road off-ramp was a known trouble spot for police where drug deals and other crimes often occurred. Police defended their delay in searching for Kara, saying that just because someone doesn't show up somewhere on time doesn't mean foul play was involved. Only this time, foul play was involved. There were obvious head injuries, and police quickly concluded it was a homicide. The coroner determined she had been dead at least six hours before she was found. Sam, Kara's father, wondered if she had been abducted at the gas station. He told the media that he'd encouraged all three of his daughters to learn how to defend themselves, and that Kara had taken a self-defense course a couple years earlier. Kara's family put up a $10,000 reward for information that may lead to a suspect in her death. Others speculated that maybe she picked up a hitchhiker who became her killer. But her family and friends said absolutely not. Kara was a careful person who knew how to avoid dangerous situations and would never pick someone up. The next day was Monday, and local TV station KCEST interviewed Officer Craig for a story on how women could protect themselves. And he said anything could happen. Being a female... You could be raped or robbed if you're a male, all the way to where you could be killed. In the beginning of January, Suzanne, who had been stopped by Craig nine months earlier, told the Times Advocate that she suspected a CHP officer was responsible for Kara's murder, and she recounted her own scary experience. Another woman contacted local TV station, KFMB, and told her story of how in November she was driving her Volkswagen when Officer Craig pulled her over on the Mercy Road off-ramp, the same area where Kara's body was found. Meanwhile, it had been two weeks since Kara's murder. Police were receiving tips and little bits and pieces. Then on Thursday, January 15, 1987, detectives received crucial information that put the pieces together and spun the case into overdrive. At 7 p.m. that evening, homicide detectives showed up at the home of CHP Officer Craig Pyre, and arrested him on suspicion of killing Kara. As he was led out of his home by detectives, he told a reporter, I didn't even do it. He was transported downtown and held without bail in the county jail. The next morning, Craig appeared at his hearing dressed in a blue jail uniform. He said nothing. His lawyer asked for a postponement, and it was granted. He would continue to be held in jail without bail. The district attorney asked the judge to seal the 50-page affidavit, which included a vast amount of evidence until Craig's arraignment, and the judge agreed. A press conference was held after his arrest, and police surmised that Craig had pulled over Kara that dark night and forced her to drive to the deserted off-ramp. Then something went horribly wrong. The day after Craig's arrest, four women came forward to say they had been stopped by him as well, and although all four hadn't been harmed... They all said their stops were unusual. Craig was quietly taken off of patrol on January 5th and put on administrative leave 
He had been with the police force for 13 years, the last eight in San Diego. He had been married three times and had just moved with his wife and young daughters to their new home in Poway a year earlier. His neighbors described him as a nice guy who was liked by many and that he loved his children and his job. Craig's friend Clark Nash, who had known him for most of his life, told the Times Advocate they went to the same high school and played baseball together and said Craig would never lie. When he says he didn't kill her, I know he didn't kill her. Another friend of the family, Debbie Geyser, said the media doesn't know Craig. I know Craig really well. I know his family really well. I know he's not capable of killing someone. Friends and neighbors created a fund to help support Craig's family while he was in jail on unpaid leave, and a second fund was created to pay for his legal defense. Meanwhile, Kara's family requested that the Mercy Road off-ramp that led to her death be closed. The road wouldn't be needed for at least a year, and it led to an isolated area surrounded by bush that was very dark at night. Late January, city officials agreed and closed the exit. On February 4th, the coroner's report on Kara's autopsy was released. She had been strangled with either a rope or a wire, may have been beaten in the face, then her body was thrown off the bridge to the creek bed 65 feet below. There was no evidence she had been sexually assaulted, and tests for alcohol, drugs, and poison were negative. A week later, it was revealed that Craig was being paid his full salary of just over $3,000 a month, including back pay to when he'd been arrested. The CHP were following system guidelines and had no choice. Craig's defense attorney, Robert Grimes, was appointed by the court to defend him after the judge found the officer's assets were limited and his legal fees would be paid by the county. The judge turned down his lawyer's request to release him on a $100,000 bond. Instead, due to the seriousness of the charges, the judge held him on a $500,000 bond. Then a short time later, the judge heard new evidence against Craig and doubled his bail to $1 million. Traffic tickets that Craig had written before his arrest were now in jeopardy. He wrote more than 200 tickets per month. Numbers were not released, but many were dismissed. Friends and family managed to raise enough money to post his $1 million bond. On March 4th, Craig walked out of the jail into his wife's arms. He pled innocent to Kara's murder charge. His preliminary hearing was scheduled for April 20th and would determine if there was enough evidence for a trial. When the hearing began, fellow patrol officer Linda Alley testified that Craig trained her for a few days in May 1986, and during their training he took her to the Mercy Road off-ramp and told her that if she ever wanted to dump a body, this would be the place to do it. Craig's brother-in-law, Craig Mulhesen, also an officer, testified that Craig had explained the scratches on his face were for falling on a chain-link fence. His sergeant, Gary Simmons, said Craig told him the same thing. And Officer Joseph Riordan said Craig pulled over a car without taillight sometime between 9.30 and 9.45 p.m. He then saw Craig later at the patrol office after a shift and saw blood on his forehead, and he explained that he'd fallen near the gas pumps. During the hearing, Kara's family testified to her self-defense training two years earlier and that her instructor, Sanford Strong, had told students to fight back if they couldn't get away. He recommended they use their fingers and nails to gouge the attacker's eyes, face, and throat. More women came forward and testified about traffic stops by Craig. Cheryl Johnson said she was at least eight car lengths past the Mercy Road exit when she was pulled over. Craig insisted she put her car in reverse and back up to the exit. She suggested she drive ahead to the next exit because it was illegal to back up on the interstate, but he insisted on the Mercy Road exit. When they reached the bottom of the exit, they both turned their car lights off and Craig talked to her for an hour and 40 minutes. Kathleen Deere then testified that she was pulled over by Craig in December. He told her she had a problem with her headlights. He then invited her into his car and took her on a tour of the old Highway 395 bridge. After an hour together, they shook hands and parted ways. Adele Tolgar testified how Craig stopped her on Halloween night around 9 p.m., telling her that her headlights were dim and she had an oil leak and it wasn't safe to drive her car. She told him she only had a short distance to go, but he insisted on driving her. 
A total of eight women testified about being stopped by Officer Craig Pyre and then being instructed to drive to the far end of the Mercy Road off-ramp. One man, David Smith, testified that Craig stopped him and said his headlight was out of adjustment, but it wasn't, and he wasn't given a ticket. Fiber expert John Sims with the San Diego Police Department testified about a crucial piece of evidence, one gold thread, that was found on Kara's sweatshirt. It was only an eighth of an inch long, but it had the same characteristics as the very distinctive gold thread found on the emblem patch the CHP officers wore. He also testified that blood found on Kara's boot was not hers, and that the blood type matched Craig. Now, this was before DNA testing, so they could only go by blood type. John Sims also found skin cells and blood under Kara's fingernails on her right hand, but that the particles were too small to determine blood type. He also analyzed blonde hair strands found at the top of the old 395 bridge, directly above where her body had been found. The strands matched Kara's hair. It was also revealed that Kara's empty car had been spotted at 9.45 p.m. that night, by a man who'd gone to the isolated area with a female friend, and a couple who were stranded on the side of the road in a broken-down limousine saw a police car speed away from the Mercy Road exit between 9.30 and 10 p.m., and they remembered it because they thought a police car would have stopped to help them. On May 4th, the judge ruled that there was sufficient evidence presented at the hearing and Craig would go to trial. On May 29th, he was finally fired from the San Diego Police Department, Meanwhile, Craig's lawyer was preparing for his trial and was challenging the testing techniques used on the blood found on Kara. He questioned if the techniques were reliable and scientifically accepted. In December, a judge ruled that they were admissible. He also ruled that the testimony of 19 people that Craig had stopped for traffic violations could be used as evidence in the trial. In January 1988, a jury of eight men and four women were selected. Their ages ranged from 24 to 73. During the trial, the Times Advocate reported that it was revealed that Craig had questioned a fellow officer about Kara's murder. He'd asked Officer Jill Govey a few days after her death for the scoop on her murder. She told him that she didn't know much. He then asked her why an autopsy was being done, and she told him it was typical in unnatural deaths. He then asked her what information an autopsy would provide and she told him that maybe the attacker's blood type and race. Jill also mentioned that Kara might have the attacker's skin under her fingernails. She then noticed that Craig began cleaning his fingernails. Jill then mentioned that Kara had been thrown off the west side of the bridge, but Craig told her she didn't know what she was talking about. Kara had been thrown off the east side of the bridge. Evidence later proved that she indeed was thrown off the east side of the bridge. But how could Craig have known that? Then Craig asked Jill what she thought would happen when Kara's murderer was caught, and she responded, I hope he dies a slow and painful death. She said Craig then became angry and stated that death may have been an accident. Maybe it was a situation that went out of control. Maybe it just went too far. He then strode to his car and sped out into traffic, so fast that other cars had to slam on their brakes to avoid hitting him. San Diego Police Detective Gene Black testified that tire tracks matching the width of Craig's patrol car were found on the old Highway 395 bridge where Kara's body had been found. Lee Bach Hacker, who performed Kara's autopsy, testified that the width of a 48-inch piece of rope found in the trunk of Craig's patrol car matched the ligature marks found on Kara's neck. Barbara Beck, an evidence technician, testified that several purple fibers were recovered from the bridge railing directly above where Kara's body was found. She had been wearing purple sweatpants when she died. By now, the trial had gone on for a full month. The Times Advocate describes the day the jury was taken to the place where Kara died. They were transported by van at 4.30 p.m. Silhouetted in the salmon-colored sky of an ending day, the graceful span of the old Highway 395 bridge stood next to the interstate that replaced it. A group of jurors shivered in the creek bed, looking up at a flashlight beaming on the bridge where a strand of Kara Knott's blonde hair had been found shortly after her death. Her body was discovered 65 feet below. Craig, who was accused of killing Kara, was along for the tour. His face remained impassive as he walked with the jurors. 
as darkness settled in, and even with the crowd and the interstate traffic thundering overhead, the spot was eerie. The jury went to the bridge where a low rail was the only barrier to a long fall to the creek bed. Craig avoided the spot where Kara had been thrown from the bridge. On February 17th, the jury began deliberations. Eight days later, they became deadlocked. Five members of the jury felt the prosecution hadn't shown a clear motive. A mistrial was declared. The prosecutors vowed to retry Craig. Jury selection for the second trial began in April, and the trial began in May. The prosecution's strategy was the same, except this time they presented their case using a timeline showing a gap in Craig's day from 8.30 to 9.45 p.m. They presented many of the same witnesses and had the jury also tour the murder site early on in the trial so that they could picture the events as they heard them in court. While the jury was deliberating Craig's guilt or innocence, Kara's mother sat by her daughter's grave and wrote, We are fighting for justice as hard as we know how, just as you fought for your life with all the strength you had. We miss you so. On June 22nd, after five days of deliberation, the six men and six women jury convicted Officer Craig Pyre of first-degree murder. Craig was sentenced to 25 years to life. His lawyers appealed the decision, but it was denied in 1990. Sarah's family constructed a memorial garden at the site where she lost her life, and on November 30, 2000, Kara's father was tending to the garden, and just a few yards from where she died, he too passed away from a heart attack. In 2004, as part of a wrongful conviction project, the San Diego County District Attorney's Office asked Craig if he wanted key evidence tested for DNA. He replied no. Craig was denied parole in 2004, 2008, and 2012. The board also determined he would not be eligible for parole again until 2027. Craig has never admitted to killing Kara. He is incarcerated in a California state prison. The Los Angeles Times reported that Kara's mother, Joyce, doesn't think about Craig, but rather remembers her daughter. In 2003, she found the courage to redecorate Kara's bedroom, and when removing the wallpaper found a beautiful memory. Underneath was a drawing of flowers and the words, My name is Kara. I am 14 years old. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20 with less talk and more true crime. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of Tiffany Adams and her unborn son, Bernstein. On a short walk to her mother's house in November, she disappeared. Two months later, a farmer tending to his cornfield found her body. Her cell phone, pulled from its watery grave, led to her killer. We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music and our many editorial sources who are listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and YouTube. And every week, we announce upcoming episodes on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until then, stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers. <laughs>